So yeah, welcome back after everyone got a little bit of coffee. Uh, so my talk today is about replacing an Oracle server with FreeBSD, OpenZFS, and Postgres. Uh, so it's a bit more database focused, but there's enough operating system content in there to be uh, a valid open source operating system talk. So um, this is, uh, so I talk a lot about um, in other conferences and other venues that I go to about my work in FreeBSD and how I got involved there. Uh, this talk is a little bit more about my normal work, uh, if you want to call it that, at the University of Applied Sciences Darmstadt in Germany. And um, uh, so this talk is basically my daily job, a little bit describing what I'm doing there and uh, uh, particularly the database server that I uh, set up with uh, FreeBSD and uh, OpenZFS in the background. So here's a little bit of background to uh, actually paint the picture for you to that, so that you know what I'm uh, talking about and what kind of uh, Thing this is. So I work at the computer science department at the University of Applied Sciences in Darmstadt, as I said, uh, half an hour away from Frankfurt Airport, very convenient for travel. Um, so, and they have their regular computer science undergraduate and master's degrees, and part of that undergraduate degree, there's a database class. Um, we used to have two database classes, but with the next three accreditation, we're going to lose one, so we'll have one big uh, database course. And um, so this is mandatory, so all the students who want to have their degree at the end need to go through this class, no matter how much they dislike this one. Uh, so, and this course is basically intended to teach them all about databases, you know, relational databases, the tables, the databases, the, the triggers, the stored procedures, all the things that you are required to know to be uh, dangerous enough in databases. And so we typically have like uh, 80 students in the summer term, um, and that's because our biggest lecture hall only takes 80 students, so we have four parallel database classes, so four professors, or maybe uh, one professor is brave enough to have two of those 80 students. Uh, so they have um, these group sizes, and that's what our typical database classes are uh, looking like. Of course, uh, that's only what they look like at the beginning of the semester, and at the in the medium uh, term, they are kind of like, you know, dwindling down, it's uh, melting down, there's maybe like 60 left or so, and uh, the week before semester ends and the uh, uh, end of term is reaching and everyone is uh, excited about classes, everyone's reappearing. Um, but these courses uh, also include uh, mandatory database labs, so students have to do these labs to actually be allowed into the actual exam. And that's where um, I come in because I need to provide the infrastructure for the, uh, for the labs, for the professors to do their teaching on. And uh, when I was a student uh, in the same department, I was also um, using the same setup. So I also had to use Oracle in this database classes. So at, at that time, I was new to Oracle anyway, so it was a new database to me. At that time, it was only, I did a little bit of dabbling with um, the classical LAMP stack, you know, MySQL was a thing. Uh, but then I saw Oracle and it's like, mm, okay, they can do a little bit of different things in MySQL. Uh, luckily, I discovered Postgres in the meantime between those two, so I had a much better experience that. So um, by that time, I had a bit more uh, overview of what kind of databases are available. Um, but we had to use Oracle. And the reason was because the professors uh, thought that um, they had to teach Oracle to the students because that's a very likely thing that the students will encounter later in the industry. And uh, this was backed by the Oracle Academic License, so they gave out um, basically free versions of uh, Oracle so that students can use that to um, get to know with the product and have more uh, experiences outside of the regular database classes. And that included also uh, support and you know a lot of uh, material um, documentation, of course, and um, little exercises and test data, basically. Uh, so that went uh, well so far as they, uh, the department had set up um, two database servers. But the second one was mainly just as a standby if the main server would crash and burn in particular, uh, or in particular ways. Um, and we used uh, SQL Plus and SQL Developer in the database classes for the actual uh, you know, database modeling and the relationship, the entity relationship. Uh, and that is part of the first two laps in that uh, class. So that is, um, and then it starts, you know, with the SQL, the create tables, the, the insert, update, delete statements that everyone has to go through. And um, they had a very particular user uh, name schema. So every student uh, was assigned a, um, a username that they could use throughout the semester. 
and um, of course, since you had like 320 students to take care of, they had these uh, interesting uh, username schema, and uh, each one had the same password, so that was um, kind of interesting. Um, many of you are, who are sysadmins are like, oh my god, how could this work? And uh, yeah, that's, that's academia. Uh, it's, I mean, my production environment is basically just six months at, at all, or even just four sometimes. Uh, and then we basically reinstall the whole thing or roll back to a previous snapshot and then the next semester starts. So we don't have this issue of like, I mean, we have nothing to protect in this kind of class. There's no data that um, should be uh, protected other than maybe some class solutions that uh, the students have worked on and another student group grabs them because they know the password from that. Um, but it's a different environment. We don't need to take care of backups too much because all the data the students are creating is being uh, just for educational purposes. So it's, it's not uh, too critical if we lose a little bit of data. But it's still bad if we, if we get that. So this is basically how I uh, got introduced into um, not only uh, databases, but also into Oracle and all these other um, database concepts that were unknown to me by then. And so, um, this server has been running basically uh, until I started working at the university, and then now that I was an employee by then, I saw a little bit more what, in, what uh, got involved in that and how that server was running and who was administering that. And so now I'm in the database group, which is like uh, seven professors, three employees, um, the lab engineers, they're basically taking care of the labs and the big data cluster that we have, that's my sole purpose uh, in that uh, employment. And, um, a few uh, PhD students. So this is a, a small database group within the CS department, and they uh, let those servers um, run and do the things for education. And that was running for, for many years, and everything was fine so far. Um, but at one point, things went downhill, uh, as you might have guessed, uh, with Oracle, not only with the, the ZFS disaster that many uh, people have uh, talked about already and are uh, familiar with it. And so Oracle kind of uh, cut down their whole academic uh, engagement, and uh, that included us as well. Uh, so at one point, we got an email, well, uh, the academic licenses are discontinued for educational uh, or universities uh, institutions, and they have to either purchase a license for educational purposes at a certain price, or um, you know, find some other arrangements. They didn't write that explicitly, that we should switch to a different database, but you know, they want to still be in the position to uh, be the first database that student got uh, exposed to. And of course, then you uh, talk to the representative. I wasn't involved to that, uh, in that too much, but um, the colleague that uh, did that was basically saying, well, it's 100% cost increase. They want the same uh, kind of money that companies are paying for a regular Oracle license. And uh, they also don't provide the documentation anymore or the other extras that we would get uh, with the academic license. This would be a complete turnaround. Um, and so this is definitely not something that we liked very much. And uh, in an uh, operating systems uh, or computer science department like we are, we are uh, focusing on a lot of um, uh, open source software. We try to use that as much as possible. And so we thought, uh, why not look at open source software to not only cut costs here, but also provide the same feature set that we're um, trying to teach to the students. So the database had to uh, support start procedures, triggers, and all these more advanced concepts of databases. So um, some of the more uh, easier databases in open source uh, quickly fell through the um, decision matrix. And um, by doing that, I also um, saw a little bit more of what the, the server uh, was using. So this was basically a Windows machine running uh, the standard installation of the Oracle installer, basically just clicking through, because they didn't know any better at that time when they set that up. And they had snapshots. So by the time they moved that from a physical machine into a virtual environment, and they had snapshots made uh, at the beginning of the semesters where all the student accounts were created, and um, some of those students' accounts were locked out for whatever reason, and each time they would restore that backup, the, some of the accounts would also be locked, and so it was the same state all over again, and there was always the surprise in the first two laps when the students started logging in uh, that they couldn't access certain accounts. And there was always confusion why that was. And uh, so then we looked at how we have this department uh, with uh, LDAP connectivity where all the student accounts are registered anyway. So why not um, 
grab that information and let each student use their own accounts uh, or account data that they are using for, for Wi-Fi and other services that we provide. Uh, but that required, uh, from the Oracle side of things, that we need to set up a separate server and uh, add Kerberos support to that to actually make that possible to talk to our LDAP server. So that would require extra costs, extra setup, and you know, if you like Kerberos or not, it's a different um, kind of setup and a bit more involved. Uh, also, uh, by the time uh, they figured out that, oh my god, there's a lot of students uh, using this server and um, they did not uh, take care of separating that from the operating system, so they basically put everything in the operating system installation. And uh, more often than not, at the end of the semester, the whole partition would fill up because students would create data and create databases and tables. And um, sudden, sometimes there was no disk space left on the operating system partition because some student figured, oh, why not load this multi-gigabyte file into the database and figure out what the database is doing with that. Or a redo logs would also accumulate and all these things would fill up disk space. And so they had to uh, restore that in uh, various interesting ways if they could still access that uh, operating system. And there was also no query timeout set, so a student could run a very long query that would basically never end because they did an error in their little programming for uh, their stored procedures. I mean, they're beginners. They're, they're not maliciously trying to uh, sabotage that. But if you're learning, you make mistakes, and um, that server would not cope with that very well. Uh, and the server, of course, was mostly running the default settings from the installation that they did way back when, and there was no you know, tuning or setting certain parameters that would prevent um, uh, overruns of um, runtime or certain other uh, set you can just do as a sysadmin to sleep a little bit better. Uh, and as I said, since you know the database uh, accounts and the database schema and everyone in the first lab got announced, hey, this is your user ID and oh, surprise, everyone has the same password, you would quickly figure out, okay, if I'm a very bad student, I could look at the, the, the group that is al already finished and I can log into their account and grab their solutions. So that's less than obvious or less than optimal in an educational environment. And so since we're already um, starting to evaluate other uh, servers or other databases, we uh, looked at uh, options and we figured out, okay, what are our requirements? We basically want the same feature set that we currently have with Oracle. Uh, as I said, the sort procedures, the triggers, that's part of the curriculum anyway, and we don't want to change that just because we're switching to a different operating system or a, a database software. And uh, the same thing was also, it should be supported as a client so that students can uh, do the labs at home or log in from our VPN solution and it should be available to have clients for Windows, Linux, the Mac OSs of this world so that we don't lock students to a certain operating system. And uh, by evaluating that, we quickly figured out that Postgres was the solution that we're going to uh, want to have because not only of the feature set, but also uh, the open source license that they have, the um, amounts of information available in like documentation and helps and forums. Uh, so Postgres fit that very well and that's what uh, our ultimate decision was. And uh, the LDAP connectivity was a bonus. We initially thought, okay, we could basically recreate that same schema, but then a colleague and I uh, interfered and said, why, if we're not restarting this whole database project anyway, we might as well figure out the LDAP connectivity and connect this to our LDAP and have each student use the username and password that only they know. And so there's less cheating because they would typically not give away their account data because it's also their Wi-Fi password and other services for the department. And so um, that was decided, so we were going to use Postgres. And then um, the question was less of what kind of operating system we're going to use because these are database researchers. They're professors, they're teaching databases, and they're doing research on that. But operating systems, they don't care too much about. And so. There was no, oh, you only have to use uh, Windows, uh, the previous solution that they had. Um, so they basically let uh, that us decide as the uh, lab engineers to find an operating system. And since I was um, involved in creating that, so I said, why not create this on uh, FreeBSD? Because it has a couple of nice features that the Linuxes don't have. And um, this is basically what this talk is about. 
So um, at the beginning, of course, you set this thing up. You're fully full of excitement because it's a new machine. This will be the greatest machine that you're going to build. And uh, it will have all the nifty features that FreeBSD has to offer. And of course, I wouldn't uh, compromise on the database front because the database also needs to set up um, a lot of things. And its data should be stored in a safe way. So I figured let's not uh, compromise something there. Let's use OpenZFS. And so um, we basically asked our IT department to provide us a virtual machine. And so they also changed their virtualization backend um, a year ago uh, to use Overt, the Overt solution. And they had uh, backed that by a cluster FS file system. So that was new to me, but I wasn't involved too much. They just gave me the VM credentials to log in and set up the machine. Uh, and I couldn't make much decisions about what kind of um, environment this would be. And so we initially thought, OK, the old server had used like um, 8 gigabytes of RAM. Let's double that just in case um, there's something going on. Or because of ZFS being a bit more uh, memory hungry, let's give it a bit more uh, RAM to chew on. And we figured, OK, roughly 200 gigabytes of disk space would be enough. This is um, basically just a rough guess. We would um, look at the old database server and how much that would use and then uh, figure, OK, maybe this is the amount of disk space we're going to need. And this was uh, started a year ago. So back then, 11.2 was out. And we used that, of course. And uh, since now, we are running this in the second semester uh, in a row. We are now, uh, we've, we switched in the semester holidays to 12.0 FreeBSD. And uh, did nothing fancy in terms of the installation itself. We basically installed the, the base operating system and did not much tuning or any other special settings that um, I would have documented this here otherwise. Uh, for uh, Postgres itself, we figured, okay, let's run this on ZFS because there's plenty of documentation out there how to do that and do that uh, in a performant way. And also, um, there's plenty of books out. For example, the FreeBSD Mastery, uh, ZFS Mastery, for example. The second book has a couple of uh, information or a couple of pages about running um, a database on ZFS. So that's, these are the settings for um, the main pool. So I created basically uh, a data set with a couple of sub data sets here uh, called Data 10, because this would be uh, Postgres 10 and a separate uh, data set below that for the log files for the database, all the redo logs, all the logs that I would write for uh, keeping track of what the students are doing, what kind of queries they're running. So that takes a lot of disk space, but it's all text, and text can be compressed very well. So um, I didn't show it here, but the actual pool is um, set to LZ4 compression by default, and I just changed the record size for the actual Postgres data, 16K. And um, I changed the primary cache to metadata because that's uh, the recommendation for Postgres. And the logs are um, different. They have a bit more uh, text size. So I um, increased the record size there to one megabyte because it's uh, better in the compression space, as, as you're going to see. And the quotas there are basically um, um, from the first time we ran it without quotas and saw how much students would create. And then in the second term, we basically um, set that quota to 65 gig. This is roughly what students were using, because there's one lab where they have to create uh, one gigabyte of data on their own, any way they like, with a program or taking a data set from the internet somewhere. Um, but students, more often than not, would take bigger data sets, since now they could load data into the database at will. Uh, and so we wanted to restrict that a little bit to not overflow our um, database uh, disk space. OK, so in Postgres terms, we have um, looked at uh, various tuning parameters, because a default Postgres installation is fine, and it's, uh, but it's very conservative in the settings that it's using. And you can um, get a lot more speed out of there in certain ways. Um, there's a nice web page called PG Tune. And there you basically enter a couple of information, what kind of memory your server has, what kind of storage is connected to it, whether it's, uh, um, you know, a NAS or a SAN or what kind of um, disks you have. And then it would create a configuration recommendation for you. And some of those uh, we took over. Some of them we tuned a little bit. And there's also uh, a bit more information about uh, the parameters that I listed here in line 9 and 10. Uh, for example, so the synchronous commit is off. So this is typically a very dangerous setting. But if you're on ZFS with its atomic commits, either the commit is happening or not, then you can do that because ZFS protects you there. Either the transaction will happen in ZFS or it will not. 
and you don't have to redo that in the database layer. So you can uh, safely um, deactivate that, and by that you gain a little bit more performance out of that. Same is true for the full page writes. You can set that to off. So uh, there's this feature in Oracle, no, not in Oracle, <laughs> forget about Oracle at this point, um, in Postgres where you can have partial page writes, so either a page is uh, partially written, not fully, uh, but ZFS mostly does away with that as well because of the way that it knows how big each page is that it's going to write because it uh, dynamically uh, changes that. And so we could uh, set that to off and also gain a little bit more uh, performance out of that. And of course, I had to adopt the log directory to the uh, data set that I created earlier. And the last setting here, the update process title, I, that's a free BSD specific setting. So basically, if you have a uh, terminal open to that server, it would update uh, the title in your little terminal uh, to what kind of query you're currently running. And if you switch that off, then it doesn't do that all the time and you save a bit of um, context switches. Uh, we were a bit aggressive with the max connections parameter because we figured, okay, let's try to provide the worst case scenario. All the students are trying to connect uh, to the server and we would each uh, give each student 10 connections uh, because they open various windows in uh, PG Admin to kind of uh, create queries and they would look up um, database uh, tables and stuff. So we figured 10 connections per user would be good. Um, but experience has shown during the semester that, that this is not even half of what students are using. Uh, typically, there is maybe like 100 connections open, so you can basically, uh, in the next iteration of this server or in the next uh, semester, we can lower this setting a little bit. And the rest is basically uh, increasing shared buffers because the 16 gigabytes uh, can work with that, and work memory of 50, meg uh, yeah, 50 megabytes is uh, so that sort operations are happening more quickly. Uh, so all these settings here are basically the the results of our learnings from running this for two semesters. There's typically one, uh, the winter semester, that has uh, four of these groups, and the summer term only has uh, two database labs for the students who didn't, who failed in the first uh, iteration, and so they have a chance to do that in the summer again. Um, but these labs are typically less uh, full than the ones in the winter term. Okay, so that's Postgres. Um, so we also had a couple of uh, considerations that we threw away. Uh, so when you sit down and plan this server, we kind of, ah, we should do this and that, and this would be great, and this is definitely better than uh, the previous Oracle in installation, but um, some of these things, after we implemented them, were kind of like, okay, hmm, this is not as good as we thought it would be. So um, each user initially would get their own database on a separate data set and table space, and we would dynamically create that for the students. Because with the table space, we can limit what kind of um, disk space or uh, where this data is being placed. Um, but we looked then at Postgres, how do we implement it from the database side? Uh, and then we found that there is actually no solution yet for limiting um, or providing a quota for a database or a, or a user. They still haven't uh, implemented that. This has been requested a number of times in the years and years that um, Postgres is running, or Postgres as a project is running, uh, but there was always like, no, no one's working on that. It's been requested, but no one's currently working. So we would figure, okay, this is kind of bad, and we need to rethink uh, that. We didn't know that before. And we would also, uh, if we would run it with this solution, require that the students would also have to put the table space keyword into all their statements, like create table, blah, table space, X, Y, Z. Um, and that's kind of tedious for a new student who has never worked with databases before or never run a create table statement before because then they have to also each time consider the table space part into it. And if you're learning and you always look up uh, solutions on the web, then there's no table space part and then they ask questions, why do I have to use table spaces on this server? And so we did away with that and thought this would be too complex for the students to initially learn this kind of concept. Instead, we thought, okay, let's put all the databases on the same database pool, and then, um, in order to not run out of disk space, let compression handle most of that. Because if you uh, look this up, or remember, if, you're, if you did ever a database class, all the students have to do the same assignment, so all the students will create the same data. So there's a lot of redundancy, and this is what uh, the compression will definitely take care of. But now we're in a situation where it's like, okay, we have the server in place. How do we 
decide what kind of access we give to the students or what students will actually get access to the server. Uh, so we basically compiled Postgres uh, from ports because we needed the LDAP support and that's not part of the package. Yes, we could run our own Poodrier and build our own packages and uh, that was, at the time, it was a minor issue, so this is not too difficult. We, add, we also added D-Trace support for debuggability because we thought we would introduce uh, the operating system professors more to D-Trace so they could show uh, the students this is how a transaction would traverse the uh, database and like from begin to commit. Um, but this hasn't happened yet, but I kept D-Trace active, so um, in case there's something to debug, I have it available. But back to the problem. So we have now uh, activated um, our database, and um, then we we're like, okay, we have like 4,000 students in the CS department at the moment who would potentially use this database server, uh, but not all of them are in the proper semester and would uh, use the um, Postgres server. Uh, so, but how do we create kind of uh, these many accounts for them? Because that's kind of tedious as, an, uh, <laughs> as a manual work. Um, of course, there's automation tools and uh, shell scripts you could write, the Ansible's, the, uh, the other automation tools of this world would take away with that. But um, each database we create would initially take up a couple of disk space. Not, not much, but it all adds up at the end. So we would th thought about, okay, how would we, uh, how about we create a solution that the students would create their own databases? Because if you log in via LDAP, then there needs to be, and, you, and the LDAP server says, yes, the student's credentials are correct, username and passwords are matching, then Postgres would say, no, I don't know about this user, I cannot let that person into the database server because there's no database for that student I can reroute it to. So there first needs to be an, an existing Postgres account in order to let LDAP users log into that. But how would we know what kind of student is currently logging into that server? We don't know the database uh, classes. I mean, we could get a list from, our, um, from each professor, but you know how this goes. Students switch classes at the last minute, and there's late uh, students, and it's always someone that doesn't have an account. So we thought about, let's create a solution where the students would create their own accounts, but we will, would give not... Um, any administrative credentials to them. So what we did is we let the students SSH into the database server, and that triggers the database account creation. I will show how in a while. And uh, using that SSH login, we grab the user, the username that's currently logging into that, and pass that to an SSH RC script that would basically take care of the um, account creation. And this means that only the students that are actually in the database classes and actually want to work with the database server are using uh, the database server and are getting a database created. The other students in the department uh, won't care and we don't need to add extra disk space for that. And the, the plus on that is also, since they're running um, an SSH shell, they could also use PSQL if they don't like our graphical database management uh, tools we provide, so they can run all their database classes also from uh, PSQL. But other than that, they had no special privileges. They could only run the database creation script, which they don't know about because it's all done in the background, and they had no extra uh, pseudo accesses or other privilege uh, escalation. So this is how we did it. So there's a little, um, little unknown script uh, by now. Of course, if you read SSH Mastery by Michael Lucas, uh, then you would know about this. There's a little uh, thing called etc SSH SSH RC, and this is a little shell script that you can write. Uh, initially, this is empty or not existing at all, but we thought, okay, each time a student logs in, it would run through the script, and of course, it needs to run as the Postgres user, and we pass the current user, that's the variable that the environment is providing, so we know about what kind of user ID is logging in. And uh, of course we would uh, configure our sudoers to actually allow only that command to run. And the actual uh, script is a bit longer, but it didn't fit on the screen, so I did away with all the validation for that user. Um, and basically each time a student logs in, either the database is already existing, because it um, uh, existed already, or it's new, it's a new user, and then we would run through the create user, the create database scripts, and uh, give the student the proper permissions to do um, only their own uh, database administration. So they could uh, access their own database, but they wouldn't be able to access the other databases from the students, nor the databases from the professors, who would typically have the, the solutions for the semester in their own databases to try them out first. Uh, so we did away with that by a couple of uh, revoke uh, commands. 
And so each time the students would log in, the script would run and trigger the database creation. So we, at the beginning of the uh, semester, we would tell students, okay, if you want to work with the database server, then log in via SSH. Some people have never done that before, so we have to teach them how, about PuTTY for the uh, Windows users and how to do SSH on the command line. This is a new experience for some student, uh, unfortunately, but um, yeah, a little learning on the side. And then this script would run in the background and then they can log out again if they um, don't like to work with PSQL. And then, uh, yeah, then we have a database for them, and then they can log in using graphical tools. So, next, how do we actually make that connection between the database and the LDAP that we have? Um, since we allow the LDAP login already from the operating system side, because I want to log in with my credentials from the university and don't have a separate account for that, uh, we figured there is a little PAM service. I mean, there's an official way in, in the Postgres documentation to create um, an LDAP connection between Postgres and your, your LDAP server. Um, but that was kind of, it's not difficult, but it's um, this solution here that I uh, present is a bit more uh, straightforward, I would say. So you basically add a new PAM service called Postgres, aptly named and you provide an auth line and an account line and basically run your PAM LDAP that is provided uh, or that's providing your operating system LDAP connectivity. And then you reference that in your PGHBA conf uh, by basically saying this is a, um, on this host, there are two groups, either you're a professor or uh, a teacher or you are in the student group and all of these have to run through an uh, external authentication service called PAM and then it would look up, oh, is there in etc pam.d a PAM service called Postgres? Yes, there is. And it runs through that PAM script and then would provide um, the students with those databases or with those uh, access permissions. So all the, other, if, all the other students who are not in that group, look at that here. Uh, we did the grant student to that user. And if that's not um, the case, then it must be a professor or a non-existent user and they don't get that uh, database privileges. So this is the way how we connect the LDAP into the Postgres database by just using the system LDAP which is set up already. And the students so far uh, like that solutions very well. So you can see how many databases and uh, roles we created. So there's an exercise in the database classes because some of you might wonder why are there more roles than databases. Um, so there's an exercise in the, uh, uh, the one of the last exercises in the in the class where they have to create a separate user and then create a, uh, a JavaScript or some kind of small application to uh, use uh, either ODBC or JDBC to query the database from an application. And for that, they don't want to write in clear text in the application username and password. So we give them the uh, ability to create their own user and password and allow that user to access their own uh, databases. That's why there's more uh, roles here than databases. So you can see uh, 200, uh, roughly 250 students uh, or, and professors uh, are using that service or have created databases in this way. So that was kind of uh, nice to see that each, each, each week you would look how many uh, new databases were, were, were created. Um, but how are disk space uh, considerations? What's, what's the concern there? Because again, students can create data in their own database. They, they have no um, limits there, except the uh, limits that we set in the query or in the uh, OpenZFS uh, quotas. And still, Postgres doesn't have that, so we have to do that on the data uh, or on the operating system level with uh, OpenZFS. And um, the thing is that it's fairly straightforward because ZFS just does ZFS set quota, ZFS set reservation, and then this data set that we created for the database won't run over the disk space that we allocated. And if someone is um, keen on trying to uh, mess with us, we definitely see, oh, this user has very much uh, over its own quota and we can quickly identify who that is and give him a firm talking to him or her. Uh, and um, we can see in the next slide that combined with compression, we would use a lot less disk space than we would initially uh, use on the Oracle server way back when on Windows. And coupled with the compressed arc, we can also fit a lot more data, active database data that the students are using into main memory, um, much more memory we're going to use than the actual virtual machine has assigned to it. 
And for additional um, safety, we monitor the database in regular intervals for uh, table space sizes, index sizes, and all the other um, parameters that you can get from a database just to make sure we're not um, running out of uh, crazy resource. Um, yeah, so as I said, redundancy is key here. The students uh, work in pair of uh, eight students per group, so they typically pair up in uh, groups of two. And there's eight students per lab because we don't have much more lab space available anyway. And there's typically two to three groups per week uh, that are alternating. So every other week they have the database uh, labs. And that over uh, four parallel courses. Uh, so that is a lot of redundant data. You would figure, okay, one group is already finished and the next week the other group is basically, basically creating the same kind of data. Uh, and so we have basically a very good uh, compression ratio, as you would have uh, thought here, on the uh, database pool or the database data set. But the actual data, we log basically what kind of statements the students are running, uh, also what kind of errors are being created. So that's a lot of um, Postgres extra log files that we, that we create, and we rotate the log files every day. Um, but ZFS is happily compressing that to almost uh, 12 the size of the original one. So that is definitely a gain here. So we use much less uh, disk space this way. But how are we doing on the arc? So this is an output or a screenshot from our top. And it's nice to have these, um, thank you, Alan, for adding that line into top, so that we can see how the actual compression is. So remember, this is a 16 gigabyte uh, server, but uncompressed, 65 gigabytes. So you can all press this together, and this is an 8.56 ratio, 8.59 even. And uncompressed, this would be 7.8 gigs. And this is very good because that also allows much more database data, active database data, to be in the main memory and not having to go back to the slower disk and retrieve it from there. So that is uh, kind of a nice thing to see because we also get that feedback from the actual labs because uh, they never, <laughs> they are like, uh, oh, we never thought this would be so fast on a, on a virtual machine because there's all this overhead and network connectivity. And I was like, oh, no, no, this is, uh, this is the performance I can give you. Um, and just by having the compressed arg, and I don't have to configure anything for that. It's, it's given by just running FreeBSD with OpenZFS, and this is a nice way of um, providing the students with a bit of more performance that they wouldn't uh, normally get. Uh, here's a bit more output from ZFS Mon. So I ran this for like five minutes to see how much are we on the hit ratios here. And also Postgres has a nice uh, database hit ratio through this because basically everything's kept in memory. And as long as this um, server is not restarted for some kind of uh, critical security issues or something, then uh, we can keep all, everything in the ARC. And the ARC will happily provide that down to the database. And the students can benefit from just having the data in memory. So uh, ZFS also has even more goodies that play well with the database. So we have regular snapshots to prevent any disasters in case a student uh, destroys his database in spectacular ways because they have in their own database, they can do everything. They can also say drop database and we can, uh, of course, after a little bit of whining and screaming, we can uh, restore that. Um, we also have a way to roll back to the beginning of the semester because at the beginning of the semesters we have accounts for the professors and nothing else because students create their own accounts as you've, as you've seen. And, but at the end of the semester everything's messy, there's a lot of databases no one's using anymore, extra accounts being created. But then semester is over, we just roll back to the beginning of the semester snapshot and everything's nice and clean. Professors have their databases and there's an empty um, user database. If there's a new Postgres version, well, easy enough. We create a separate data set for that and then switch the database uh, to that new one by fiddling with the rc.conf uh, parameters. Are there any system updates pending or security issues coming out? No problem, we have boot environments as well. And that makes the upgrade actually very free and I don't have to uh, worry, huh, will this survive the next reboot and, and things. So boot environments help me to actually uh, stay safe with that server even if the upgrade is happening in the semester where no one should actually <laughs> touch that server. So in summary, uh, FreeBSD's OpenZFS implementation has proved uh, very stable and reliable for us and we're kind of happy that this is uh, showing so much good performance on our uh, small database instance that we have. Uh, the compressed arc is a nice, very nice feature, and the data set compression on top of that is also very efficient. I would even 
wager to say that we don't even need the 200 uh, gigabytes anymore. We could cut that down to 200 mega or just 100 megabytes um, because that is much more efficient since the students are creating all the same data all over. It's a very good um, example for compression. And the quota and reservation that's not in Postgres at the moment, or the quota at least, um, if that's not there, then it's fine. And let just the data, or the data set limit that. If students are happy to run gigabytes of gigabytes through the database, it will at one point say no more disk space available until the um, evil sysadmin will provide more. Uh, and also, uh, upgrading Postgres and other packages around that is um, made super easy, and I think uh, we don't give the ports people too much uh, credit for that. So they're doing an amazing job by making it easy to do package install or just make install in the uh, ports directory. And it's actually quite easy, and um, the server is running on its own. I don't have to touch it very often during the semester. Uh, I just look at how the um, current number of uh, students are and what kind of um, databases there are. But it's not that I have to log into this machine every week and, and do maintenance on that. And no license costs anymore. It's a very cheap software. It's a very uh, not cheap in quality, definitely not. But we don't have to. Uh, provide any extra money for that. We can uh, look up all the information that we require on the net because I have a very good um, documentation like FreeBSD. And there's also no worries that there will be, uh, I don't know, lawsuits with BSD, CDDL compatibilities in the ZFS space. So this is very well compatible and has been for a number of years. So we're not worried on that front. Uh, of course, there's Future work, of course, we could um, do more work in the D-Trace area and um, provide a bit more into the actual curriculum about s telling students, okay, this is how an actual query is processed through a database system by just looking at um, how this transaction is being processed. Or looking at maybe we can find some more uh, tunables that would actually be beneficial by running D-Trace uh, analysis scripts to see, you know, there's a bit more to gain there. Uh, we should also switch to a newer Postgres version. The ports version switched from 9.5 to 11 or 12 even, I'm not sure. But I will definitely look at that and uh, provide a newer database version because uh, also professors in teaching needs to go uh, with a newer version and lock or show students what kind of new features there are. Uh, I should also lock down the server a little bit more. I was thinking a bit about uh, you know jails and maybe that is uh, a thing we should do because computer science students are... <laughs> They're kind of split. One half is just dumb because they don't know any better because they're still learning. And the other ones are, they know a lot already and we need to be a bit more aware of those because they're kind of creative and trying to get access to resources they don't uh, necessarily should get at. So, um, I mean, they could freely use the database user or the database um, installation, but uh, only to a certain degree that uh, they are allowed to and not like uh, run a rogue server on that. Um, but yeah, so far it's been a nice experience and um, all these open source components fit very nice together and even though they weren't originally built for that, they kind of hook very well together by just running a couple of shell scripts and gluing that together with the PAM and the SSHRC script that I showed you. And so, um, yeah, this is our uh, little Postgres server at the department. <laughs>